Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Today is a very, very special day. Uh, as a Texan, uh, today is the anniversary of the Alamo. So uh, here at Small Arms Solutions, we want to say, remember the Alamo. Uh, what we're looking at today is a relook at my past videos on the Brownells Retro Series. Now, since my first videos came out, this entire Retro Series thing has blown up. It literally has gone, uh, take out a life of its own at Brownells, and uh, they put out more and more product, and it's really, really exciting for me because, you know, my true passion has been for the early, early guns. Uh, as I've said before on many of my occasions, that my favorite rifle of the entire M16 series is the XM16E1. Uh, that is my favorite one, you know, hands down over all the models. Uh, so that's been one of the ones I've been really, really excited about. But uh, what Brownells has done is they've taken this to the next level. You know, I was going through all the number of parts, and uh, you're going to see a complete master list of all of these parts and their part numbers on our website. Brownells has redone over 60 obsolete parts. Uh, I went through all these numbers and all these codes and everything, and it, it, they've got, they literally remanufactured over 60 parts of obsolete design. We talked a little bit about cost. Uh, you know, in, in my previous videos, people have talked about, you know, you shouldn't be spending any more than $1,000 for a retro rifle. And that's not the case. Um, if you look at what goes into remanufacturing and redesigning and producing obsolete parts, it's a very expensive endeavor because you're looking at, you know, new tooling and it's parts that are not going to be going on everybody's M4. These are specifically for these guns. So there is a cost that goes involved that is involved with that. And I definitely think that Brownells has given you a very reasonable uh, cost for what their R&D is and, and having the tool up for all these obsolete parts. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of these models here and we're going to go over what parts uh, they manufacture separate that you can buy uh, to up, upgrade your own retro rifle or if you're looking to purchase uh, one of the retro rifles. Um, what we have here is I have pretty much all the current rifles with the exception of the newer ones. Uh, I have the BRN601, the XBRN16E1, I have the BRN M16A1, I have a BRN10, and I have the, the XBRN177E2. Uh, the only rifles that I am missing is the new BRN Proto, which came out at SHOT Show, and I'm also missing one of the BRN10As, uh, which is a 16-inch uh, barrel with a rifle length gas system. Uh, so we, we don't have one of those. Those are still, some of the newer ones are a little harder to get. Uh, we have the BRN10A, which is the brown stock, which is the more, more correct for the earlier ones. Uh, we do not have an AR10B, which is the one that's all black with a lightweight barrel. But uh, we're going to discuss what some of these different ones are. Now, as you see over here, you'll see some of the parts. Uh, these are the retro stocks. We have the retro upper receivers, the M16A1, the 601. Uh, we have the chrome-plated bolt carriers. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about with the chrome-plated bolt carriers, uh, when the rifles first came out, the bolt carriers had more of a, I'd say, like a, a matte chrome look to it. Uh, people really weren't happy about that. They wanted more of the, you know, the, the original shiny uh, uh, type chrome that was on the rifles. Uh, Brownells has gone ahead and taken care of that. Um, they've uh, the new the new carriers that are coming out are more of the shiny uh, type color. And another issue to address right off the bat too is the receiver colors. When the rifles first came out, the only real critique I, I really had of the rifles was the colors. They all came out black, and anybody who's familiar with these rifles knows that the Model 601, the Model uh, XM16E1, uh, and early M16A1s, and the XM177s were all the gray color. There's been a lot of difficulty throughout the industry getting anodizers who can do the gray color. It's, uh, it's Quite frankly, I don't understand why it's so difficult. It was done for you know, for decades, you know, for at least a couple of decades with no issue whatsoever. Uh, now, all of a sudden, it's uh, become an art. Um, there's only, uh, well, I'm only really aware of one company that knows how to do it and do it right, and that's U.S. Anodizing. Uh, I don't know what Victor does over there, what kind of uh, magic he's got over there, but he's the one who does the perfect versions of the of the older colors. Now, Brownells has uh, gotten together with an anodizer who is doing the gray color. Uh, in fact, the BRN601 I have here is the newer gray color. Uh, the rest of them you're going to see here uh, are more of the black. Now, the XM16E1 version does have more of a, a, it's a grayish color, but not necessarily gray. There was there were several different finishes throughout the uh, years of the development of this rifle. You've gone from having a, a greenish color, or, uh, like a matte green, to the charcoal gray, to a charcoal black. Now we're at a jet black. So we've gone through a lot of different uh, colors uh, schemes over the years. And there is a reality to that, too, is for as far as the military is concerned, there's a color palette that goes from uh, gray to black and all the shades in between. As long as the upper and lower receiver 
fit one of those color palettes, it was accepted. Now, that doesn't mean both the receivers had to be the same color. That means each receiver has to be within that. So you could have a jet black lower receiver and a charcoal gray upper. The military is fine with that. Obviously, as a commercial market, we're not. You know, we want everything to match. And it's very difficult to get everything to match. You generally have to have the exact same aluminum and everything done at the exact same time. It's a very difficult thing uh, to do uh, because aluminums are different as far as how they take color. So, you know, if you really want to get um, an exact color match, you literally have to have aluminum that comes out of the exact same batch that's used for both the forgings for the uppers and the lowers. So when you go on Brownell's websites, now you can choose whether you want to get gray or you want to get uh, the black in color. So uh, a lot of the... The gray ones are being utilized for production right now, so they're a little bit more difficult to get uh, in some of the models, but it's something that Brownells has gone ahead and has taken care of. The first model that I want to take a look at is going to be the Model 601. Now, this is a, they, they did an absolutely incredible job on this. I did a little bit of additional work on this as well. But for as far as the components are concerned, uh, this was this was a complete rifle as it was, it was purchased. Now, if you choose to build one yourself, you do have the complete uh, stock set that's green. You do have the slick side or forward assist less upper receiver. Now, the lower receiver utilizes the removable front pivot pin, the same one that was used on the Model 601 originally. And you do have the flat, no magazine fence with the plus on it. Now, also you have the charging handle. They went ahead and they recreated the, the original triangular shaped charging handle. Now, it's certainly not comfortable to use. Uh, that's why they got rid of it. But uh, they make one that's, that's an exact, I have some of, uh, some of the exact uh, 1960 or so, 65 or so original Colt parts here. And they just did, they did an incredible job. And as we talked about the gray, you do have the gray. The barrel you have here, uh, some manufactured by Faxon, did an incredible job on it. Uh, it's a 20 inch and it is a 1 in 12 inch twist. Now many of these barrels you can get in 1 in 7 as well. And why would you want that if you have the, you know, if you decide you want to go ahead and use some of the 62 grain or 77 grain. Myself, uh, to go to all the trouble to do a retro, I want a 1 in 12. Uh, you have the proper round front sight post, and you have the original duckbill uh, flash suppressor on here. And these parts are all available uh, to, you know, to you for doing your own builds. Another thing that Brown else has done is the ejection port dust cover. The original rifles came with modern uh, A2 style ejection port dust covers, which obviously is not the original configuration. Brown else has gone ahead and made the obsolete, less durable, Injection port dust cover that you'll see on all three of these models. Now, for as far as the A1 is concerned, the A1 could very well have the newer style. Uh, the newer ones uh, had the lip on it, so uh, you couldn't close the receiver uh, on, on the forward assist and bend it. So uh, for the A1, you could definitely have the current, uh, current style on there, depending on when it was made. So that one really could be technically correct. But however, the, the XM16E1 and the 601 uh, definitely would have had this earlier style. And you can tell because you have more of a hexagon uh, shape to, to the latch on here versus a rounded one. Then on the back, it would be flat on the earlier ones and it would be angled on the later ones. Again, that was so you wouldn't close the receiver uh, on the ejection port cover and bend it. Now, I did a couple extra things on this one, too. Uh, I contacted uh, John Thomas from Retro Arms. And he was able to make, and he makes, and he sells the original magazine release button, which has got parallel lines on it rather than the circular lines, which is period correct. Uh, also, for as far as the safety is concerned, on the original 601s and the real, real, real early uh, XM16E1s, you had the round dot or the round hole that was drilled in, in the safety. When we flip it over. You can see that round hole as well. And also, he made a original bolt release. The original bolt releases did not have the lever on the bottom for you to really be able to push in to lock it open from the from the side. This was something that was definitely changed very quickly because it was very difficult to, to lock the bolt open manually. Uh, this is also a part that came from John Brace. We also see we have a, a rear takedown pen that came from John Brace as well that has the, the hole in the center as well. When we look at the bolt carrier, this is a original 1965 bolt carrier uh, that I put in here, but Brownells does offer the, the rifle with their own. And the only reason I put this in was because I had it. Um, this is more of the shiny color that you're going to see now uh, versus the original ones on the Brownells 601s and XM16E ones that had the, the, the matte gray uh, to it. So I've made this rifle as uh, authentic as humanly possible. Uh, every part that you see on this rifle is available to you to purchase. Uh, again, you can go to look at, look at the code list on our webpage and you'll be able to see that. The next rifle we're going to look at is the Army version 
uh, the first one that went to the Vietnam War, and which is my favorite model. This is the, the XBRN-16 E1, and my favorite, uh, based on the XM-16 E1. It was the first rifle that went to Vietnam. This is the one that the military used, and the main difference is this has a forward bolt assist. Now, uh, you got a lot of you guys that heard me say that this was the biggest mistake that was ever put on the rifle. It was not necessary. This was done for the Army for a psychological reason. It had no mechanical value to it. It still, to this day, has no mechanical value to it. Now, for as far as somebody who doesn't want to load the gun properly, uh, it, it can be useful. Uh, but for as far as clearing malfunctions, I have never, and I, and I can't even tell you how many rounds I fired in my life out of these type of rifles. I've never had a malfunction that this thing would even have helped. But uh, we'll look at what's different about this one. The original... XBRN 16E1 or the original XM 16E1 utilized a partial fence on here, and what that was for was so you could drill and tap for the detent and the spring for the front pivot pin so it was captive. The original 601 that was a removable part, it was uh, pulled right out of the receiver, very easily lost. So this had to be basically marine proof so it couldn't be lost. So that's what the initial part uh, of, the, of the boss here was. The reason why this, this was placed here was so injection port cover was open you would have it sticking out so you'd be able to grab it so it wouldn't lay flat. This is also prior to the uh, enhancement on the newer ejection port covers with the more little bit of ramp on there. So that was one of the changes that was made on this particular model. Now this is not black. Uh, this is probably the more proper matte gray. Not necessarily the same as the original ones, but more of a matte gray. So this is a, this is a proper finish for this model. We do have the chrome-plated bolt carrier with the four assist notches which obviously was necessary for the forward assist. You also notice we have black furniture on here. Uh, the black furniture would be uh, certainly uh, pr proper for this model as well. The only ones that really ever came out in green were the original 601s, uh, the original prototype ones. Uh, everything was changed to black relatively quickly once uh, the rifles were adopted. Also, on the earlier models, as you can see, there's no trap door. Uh, and we also have a swivel on here as well. That was correct as well. The trap door didn't really start until the, the adoption of the M16A1 towards the uh, late 68, early 69 is when that started. The barrel, again, we have the same as the 601. We have a 20 inch, uh, 1 and 12 inch twist, round forward, uh, round front sight post. And we also have the proper three prong suppressor that was made. This is a much more durable design than that of the original duck bill. So it was a lot stronger than the original. And we have, uh, again, the black furniture, and we have the period correct uh, bolt catch on here, and the period correct safeties without those, uh, you know, the holes in them. That was, that was, those holes basically were from how they were manufactured. The process was changed quite a bit. Now, another part that Brownells put out that was new on here, the original rifles came with the tick mark on here that was used on the M16A2s, you know, so you can see the safe and fire. And that was something else that a lot of people did not care for. So what Brownells has done is they've now have their own uh, safety that has no tick on it. So that's another part that uh, you can replace if you have some of these rifles that are earlier. So uh, that's that's one of the, the parts right there. Other than that, this is a, a very, very close clone of the XM-16E1. The next one is the BRN-16A1. Now, this particular rifle has one of the original blemished receivers. Uh, what that was was uh, they placed safe and semi on the right side of the receiver. These were sold as blems. They were never sold as complete rifles. Uh, this is a rifle that I put together from all the parts myself. This was not bought as a, as a complete rifle. So the only thing that's out of the ordinary on this one is, is the blemish lower receiver with the safe and the semi. But you will see the tick on here. Uh, this is where the original parts were, were, were replaced. Now, this one here has the, has the more of the current uh, ejection port cover, uh, dust cover. And that was just because it could be very well proper for this. You notice we have the full magazine fence, and that was done because uh, when you would, when this rifle would drop or you would crawl or whatnot, you'd be able to push in on the magazine release and inadvertently, uh, in an inopportune time, release the magazine. So that's what this fence was uh, called or boss. Now the lower receiver forgings uh, are are very very good. They give you the A1 pattern. They don't have the reinforcements of the M16A2. So the only thing that really separates this from the uh, B, the XBRN 16E1 is you have the birdcage flash suppressor on here. You have the proper lower receiver for as far as the magazine fence, and you have uh, the same. It's the same upper receiver, same stock, and you also have a black uh, bolt carrier group, which would be proper on manganese phosphate. Uh, they got rid of the chrome plating, probably. Oh, I'd say in a 66, 67, and then that area area in there. 
And the reason why that was gotten rid of was not so much uh, there's any problems with it, you know, be, you know, it reflecting light. The main problem with it was was at the time the chrome plating process was not really the science that it is today, and there were quality control problems with um, the way the plating was done. If the plating had any kind of cracks in it, water or moisture would get underneath those cracks, and you would have a flaking or an intergranular exfoliation process. And that uh, that would cause the, you know, the corrosion of that carrier group. Now, the carriers that you buy today, that problem has completely gone away. Uh, this was just really early issues. Colt sent the uh, bolt carrier groups out uh, you know, through a second or third source to have that plating done. And it just was not done consistently. And that was really the main issue that came up with uh, the chrome plating, why they got rid of it. The manganese phosphate, you know, I would definitely will say, is cheaper. Uh, is it better? Absolutely not. The chrome plating is much easier to clean. Um, it's, it has a more of a self lubricity to it. You know, the, uh, the manganese phosphate uh, bulk carriers, they did retain the chrome plating on the inside uh, of the uh, carrier and the inside of the carrier key uh, to, for, for ease of cleaning and for having the benefits of the lubricity of the chrome. The next model we're going to look at is the XBRN 177E2. Uh, this is a remake of one of the original carbines. There is an XM 177E1. Uh, and an XM-177, the main difference between the two rifles uh, is the lack of forward assist, the earlier Air Force models. The earlier XM-177 uh, was the Sante uh, Raiders gun, which did not have the forward assist. Now, I prefer this model because, you know, I'm former Army, uh, and the Army always had to have the forward assist. So that's the only reason why I really have this one. Now, for the barrel, which makes these things a little more complicated, was the original ones had uh, short barrels, 10.5-inch barrels, with a moderator on there. Now... The moderator uh, was not what you see here. The moderator is a combination of a flash suppressor and a sound suppressor. So you had baffles on the inside of here. Uh, they were placed on these rifles uh, to try to get some of the muzzle blast down, some of the sound down, and to take care of the flash because you have a shorter barrel, you're going to have a lot more unburned powder, so you're going to have more of a flash. Now, because it has the sound suppression capability, it's, a, it's an NFA item. So what uh, Brownells has done is they've gone ahead and they've made one just as a flash suppressor. You have a 12.7-inch barrel with a pinned and welded ice suppressor here, and you also have the grenade launching groove on here. Now the handguards, they've also gone to the trouble to get these made as well. XM177s, A1 carbines, and so forth, had the the small single heat shield handguards, um, not, the, not the double heat shields we have as the M4 today. Now for as far as the carbine handguards are concerned, uh, these are not the same as the original ones. Uh, the original material that Colt used, you could step on, you could jump on, and there's no way you're gonna break it, and there's no way you're gonna squeeze it either. Um, the materials that they're using here are more of the modern Zytels, uh, so they're not the same as the original ones, but, uh, you know, some of these materials are obsolete, uh, so you're, you're not going to uh, be able to go ahead and reproduce them with, with obsolete materials. Standard um, M16A1 upper receiver, standard M16A1 lower receiver. Uh, all the guts are, are, are the same. Now, this one does have the later style ejection port cover. This is something that would be changed on the newer production ones. This, this is an older production rifle, but you can go ahead and uh, order from Brownells, one of the original uh, type dust cover doors, and replace that. That's relatively easy to do. Now, the stock is also very interesting. Now, this is the proper t uh, style stock. Now, the original rifles had an aluminum stock with a with like a lacquer type finish on it. That's a, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Unfortunately, it's escaping me at the moment. But uh, this is the polymer. This was the version 2 type stock. Um, these were used on the M16A2 carbines and so forth. And the receiver extension, this is also a special one as well. The original XM177 M16A1 carbines and, and these earlier versions all had a two-position receiver extension. Unlike the current M4 that has four and commercial ones that have six. Now, this is one you can see the original uh, safety on as well with the tick on it. This is something that you would go ahead and change change out for your, if you want anything really I have authenticity to it. You do have the standard buffer in here, which is the uh, just a three steel weight, which is fine for this model because you're going to be using uh, 55 grain ammunition that didn't have the issues with the feeding issues uh, of the 60, 62 grain SS109 type round. So that's really the only differences on the carbine is the receiver extension, uh, the buffer, and the length of the barrel and the muzzle device. Other than that, it's the exact same. Now, as I previously stated, you can get uh, one and seven inch twist barrels, you know, and uh, depending on uh, what you want, yeah, you can go ahead and do that. I, for, for me, these rifles are supposed to be 1 in 12, uh, and that's what Brownells did with them, and that's the one, you know, ones that I have. Now, there's a recently put, and you'll see a photograph of it, uh, the BRN Proto. Uh, what the BRN Proto was, was the prototype from the original AR-10 that was scaled down to uh, the 5.56, where you did have the top charging handle, you did have the brown furniture, 
Um, those just came out of SHOT Show this year. Uh, I hope to have one in a few weeks. Uh, we're not quite sure. There was uh, Those ones were pre-order, and uh, they had quite a few of them that were pre-ordered. We also have what's referred to as the, as the BRN-605. What the BRN-605 is, you have a basically an M16A1 carbine with a 16-inch barrel. So you have a long gas, a long gas tube, a rifle-length gas tube with a short barrel. Now, that was a model that was never really put into production, uh, but it was one that's relatively neat. It's probably one of the forerunners of the dissipator. Uh, you know, dissipators, for the most part, have you know, carbine-length gas systems with a additional uh, forward uh, front sight base and a 16-inch barrel. So that would cover all the 5.56 models. The next one is the BRN-10, which I have to say is one that I was ecstatic about when it came out. This is my personal rifle. I've had, I've had quite a few rounds through this thing. This thing works beautifully. I was fortunate enough to know about this before it came out and saw some of the prototypes. And I did offer some suggestions to Brownells, you know, some of my thoughts and everything. But uh, nobody has ever done anything like this. Nobody has ever gone and to the trouble to to redo a the classic AR-10 um, that was that was tested uh, in the early 60s. Now there's two models of this. Um, this is called the BRN-10A. What the BRN-10A means is you have the brown furniture and you have a fluted heavy barrel underneath the handguard. Then you have the BRN-10B, which has black furniture and it has a lightweight barrel. Um, also, the BRN-10A has the open prong flash suppressor, and the BRN-10B has the closed uh, flash suppressor. Also, notice some of the changes that were made. You have a period correct front sight base that would look like it would just come out uh, on a on a Sudanese uh, or a Portuguese type rifle. Now, the handguards have no heat shields. Uh, aesthetically, they are correct uh, for the way that they look. Uh, the one thing that's different is, is they do utilize a slip ring on here, uh, unlike the other ones that had a, basically a screw type uh, mechanism that held the handguards on. This is also to give it some more compatibility. Now, the upper and lower receiver, uh, according to Paul Levy, and Paul Levy's the guy at Brownells, he's the brains behind all this retro series, they took an original AR-10 rifle and laser it measured it. So you had the exact same dimensions as the original rifle for the upper and lower receiver, which was really, really cool. You see we have the top charging handle. And also what we have here is this is the prototype of the new waffle pattern magazines. Uh, obviously the rifles that came out, it was uh, it came out with a standard, if you want to look at it like a, a 5.56 magazine on steroids. It had the same profile uh, type magazine. These rifles all utilize this, this waffle pattern. This is more of a blue. This is a black in color. The ones that are being produced are going to be a little bit more of a gray. Now, looking at the lower receiver, now looking at the lower receiver, this lower receiver will not take the P-Mags. This is designed the exact same way the original one was. This is a little bit longer on here, so the P-Mags and the polymer magazines will not work. You're going to be utilizing uh, either a steel mag or the aluminum magazines uh, for these that are straight, which is period correct. You have a period correct magazine release button, and uh, you also have a little bit of a, you know the same hole in the center for the safety. You rotate, you have a period correct bolt release, bolt catch. And a period correct safety on the side here as well. The bolt carrier. Now, the rifle, they didn't want to make it entirely the original because of the fact you'd have compatibility issues. What they wanted to do was to make the parts compatible with what's currently available. So if the rifle, anything was to fail at you, you could put any part in there to get it going again. But with the way the bolt carrier is, is they did an absolute wonderful job to recreate the AR-10 bolt carrier. Now, as you can see, it's chrome plate like the original ones were. And you can see the way the back is. Now, believe it or not, this one will drop into a regular SR25 or DPMS, or you can put the other ones into this one as well. It's all compatible. You see we got a nice flat on here like the original ones had. We have the three vent holes. We have a chrome bolt. They did a very good job on this bolt carrier, uh, making this thing look as, uh, as authentic as possible. The chrome plating has been changed like everything else has. This is more of the matte chrome. You're going to see more of a shinier chrome on them. But... Uh, Again, this is uh, compatible with anything that you see out there today. It was done that way, obviously, for, for spare parts reasons. Uh, so it would not have made a lot of sense to make the original prints where it wouldn't have gone with anything else. And you see we have our, our charging handle. There was a couple different kinds of charging handles that uh, were utilized in the, in the AR-10s. One was a two-piece where, where it was collapsing or telescoping, and then you had one such as this. It's also used on the BRN Proto 5.56 rifle. Does utilize a standard beard buffer assembly, a rifle buffer assembly uh, that's modified for the 308. So basically, you have to have a slightly shorter rifle length uh, buffer. 
Another new part that's coming out as we speak is a, a an original AR-10 shaped pistol grip. This is more of a standard, um, you know, M16A1, M16601 type. It's just this isn't brown. It gives you the authentic pistol grip that was on there. They're going to be available in both black and uh, brown, so you can make that e this thing even more authentic looking. It's something else that I'm pretty excited about as well. You also have on here the front and rear pivot pins. Uh, unlike the original one, this is captive. Now, captive is just a good idea. You know, even though this is a retro, you want them you know, as close as possible. Captive pin is still a better way to go. You're not going to lose that front pivot pin. But they had the same uh, texture they had on the original ones. The rear sight, they definitely uh, went out of their way to make sure that this was correct as well. You have an elevation adjustment, uh, and wind adjustment is only on the back. The front is a fixed front sight. Uh, it's actually machined into the front sight base. But uh, to adjust, you would put an Allen head key in, in this little hole right here, and you loosen the Allen key, and you'd be able to adjust for your um, windage and your elevations done from the rear. Uh, but this was done very much identical to the way the original rifle was done. Now, the BRN-10B is everything that you see here, but black, thin barrel. Uh, that's really the only difference. Uh, and, of course, it has the, the closed uh, muzzle device. Now, a lot of these parts are becoming available as well from Brownells. Uh, of course, the stock assembly is compatible with any of these. You could put the green the black on here as well. These are all the same. Uh, of course, you could put these on the uh, rifles as well. Uh, for as far as the trigger mechanism, this maintains a standard AR-15 trigger mechanism, unlike the original uh, AR-10, for, for very good reasons. Uh, this is a much more, uh, much more durable trigger mechanism. I think it's a better trigger as well. But we also have to consider that we want to have compatibility with the, you know, the guns from uh, the, you know, the future, what we're using today. So this is really a combination of a lot of the aesthetics of the original one with some of the modern uh, advancements of the more current systems, just to maintain that parts compatibility. Now, speaking of waffle magazines, the BRN601 comes with an original steel waffle pattern magazine. The original rifles came with uh, these steel magazines. They did prove to be problematic. They were discontinued very, very quickly uh, in favor of the aluminum magazines. Keep in mind that all these magazines were designed to be disposable commodity. They weren't meant to be used over and over and over again, so they were relatively cheap. Uh, but Brownells has a uh, retro magazine that comes with the 601. Of course, it can be used in any of the rifles. But each each 601 comes with that magazine. So here's a quick look at today where we're at with the the Brownells retro series. Again, I, you know, hats off to Paul Levy. He's just done an absolute incredible job. You know, he's also listened, uh, you know, to uh, advice of people who are experts in the field to make things even better. Um, they've uh, they, they just keep updating these rifles. This is not stagnant. You know, the parts that uh, people wanted to have uh, made to make the rifles even better, they're doing it. You know, I also want to, you know, say to John Thomas, he does an excellent job when you want to go to these uh, 601s, when you want to get these specialized magazine release buttons, uh, pivot, the pivot pins, the takedown pins, the safety, uh, and the bolt catch, so you can get that much more originality to the to the 601. For the most part, the, you know, the uh, XM16E1 and M16A1 these are these are current parts. You know, there uh, those parts were 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 changed, and they pretty much have stayed the same throughout the evolution of the system. The 601 is the one where you had those differences in those fire control group systems and those parts that were really specialized. That uh, John Thomas does an excellent job at recreating. Uh, but for as far as the authenticity, these guys have just done uh, a, a great job. Again, if you go to our webpage, you'll see a complete list of all these parts. Again, there's nearly 60 components. Uh, in their retro line it were developed specifically for the retro rifles. These things, uh, as far as the rifles are concerned, they have all been 100% reliable. They're all accurate. In fact, this particular XBRN-16E1 you're going to see coming up on a video on 9-hole review uh, during one of their uh, combat accuracy drills. Uh, you're going to see how this thing performs out to 500 yards, which uh, I'm curious to see how that comes out myself because these were not designed for 500 yards. These were designed for practical accuracy up to 300 yards. Uh, so I'll be curious to see what his results are for as far as the practical accuracy on these original rifles with the original ammunition. You know, when you start comparing the original A1s to the A2 with the 62 grain, you're looking at really a different animal for as far as what your range is concerned. But uh, being the fact these were designed and they were used in the jungle, they were just what was needed in the Vietnam War. Uh, if you have any any really interest in uh, the history of this rifle, I would recommend you uh, take a look at my video on what happened to the M16 in Vietnam, which gives you a more detailed review of exactly what happened uh, with the development, uh, the issues that the rifle had, and why, and how they were corrected. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, even better share, and please consider becoming a Patreon supporter.